All right, I think I'm going to just go ahead and get started here. We're probably going to have a few people joining us uh, as I babble to you uh, about my role at the, Sci at the Science Museum. Uh, I'm Aliyah Vinick. I'm the events manager here, and I'm so happy to see or see all of you joining our call today for Coffee with a Curator. Uh, and I also want to thank you for your continued support of our mission to make science education accessible to everyone. I can't believe it, but we've been running these events virtually now for a year. We started our, we did our first Coffee with a Curator back uh, in October of last year, and uh, it's just been great to explore all these different topics uh, with our members and with uh, scientists and educators at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And as always today, we'll be running this program with a few different presenters. And the best way to see them is by choosing speaker view in the upper right of your Zoom screen. And as you know, we'll explore uh, our topic today, which is indigenous food with our, a couple of presenters before we open it up for Q and A. So I hope you uh, come to this call awake and drinking coffee and ready to ask questions. You can use the chat window in the bottom of the screen to share your thoughts and questions. And I will facilitate that conversation with our presenters today. So I want to say that I'm especially excited about today's topic, as I've been lucky enough to enjoy food at Owamni, uh, and some of you probably know that's the fuzzy new restaurant in Minneapolis that serves only Indigenous foods. But I think it's prompted a lot of people to wonder what Indigenous food is. So today we've invited special guest Armando, Armando Mandu, uh, as he goes by, Medina Selly, to tell us more about what that means. Mandu will share his work documenting and sharing Indigenous food and foodways as the Indigenous Education Director at Natives. Uh, we're also joined today by Dr. Ed Fleming, who is the Curator and Director of the Anthropology Department at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Ed will share cooking related findings at pre-European contact sites in the Midwest and discuss how this research can contribute to the conversation about indigenous foodways. Both, I wanna thank you for joining us today. And Mandu, to start, I'm gonna hand it over to you to tell us a little bit more about what indigenous food means. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to do this. It's, it's fun to meet new people and talk about indigenous foods in general. So, yeah, as Alia said, my name is Armando. I go by Mandu because it's easier. I work at Natives, which is the North American traditional indigenous food systems. And if you could move to the next one, please. Uh, so I wanted to start with this very, very basic, simple definition because we, as part of our work, we talk a lot about food waste. And I know that there is a bit of uh, confusion even to understand what we mean when we talk about food waste in general. So I put here a couple of definitions, one from a dictionary that it's very, very simple. It says that uh, food waste are the eating habits and culinary practices of people in, in current and historical times as well. In the social sciences, a little more developed definition of what food waste are, the cultural, social, and economic practices relating to food production and consumption. And that is one important aspect that I wanted to highlight, and I always try to highlight, is that when we talk about food waste, we're not just talking about the food we eat. So you now we're talking about all other aspects of that are related to food. So it's a very holistic approach to foods in general, in which we consider the cultural, the economic practices, and not only about what we are consuming, but the way we are producing it and how are we acquiring all those foods and all of that. So anyway, would you move to the next one, please? So having that basic idea of food waste, we have to consider a lot of other aspects of food in general, like food waste are culturally constructed. That's something really important because depending on the culture, depending on the traditions, food waste are gonna be understood and they're gonna be different. Even if they might be cultures living in the same type of environment, maybe their food ways are gonna be a little bit different. They might have some differences and stuff. So your culture is what is helping you define what your food ways are basically. Also food ways can serve to mark uh, or mark social boundaries and identities. You know, like us as humans, all of us, we identify uh, who we are based on what we eat. You know, like I put a couple of pictures there, like one of them that maybe looked like little rocks to you, but that's, uh, uh, a dehydrated potato basically that we call chuño in the part of the world where I come from. And it's something that I identify with very strongly because it's something that I grew up with eating constantly. And it's uh, a particular characteristic of my uh, food waste and my culture. So that's one way how we identify depending ourselves, depending on what we eat and everything. And also the way we eat it. That's why I put a picture of chopsticks there, you know, because that helps us identify ourselves 
it represents part of our culture, the way we eat our food, not only what are we eating, but the way we are eating it. You know, in some parts of the world, they might use chopsticks. In some other parts of the world, they might use tortillas. In other parts, they might use injera or they might use nothing, just your hands directly, you know, or things like that. And that's a very important part of your traditions related to your food waste, how you approach uh, foods in general. Also, food waste can communicate the symbolic meaning. You know, I, again, I put another picture there that maybe to you looks like a random soup or something. But for instance, to me, that soup it's it's something that connects me with my country, with my family, and more particularly with my grandma because she used to make the best chairo ever. That soup is called chairo, and you know, I, I feel a strong connection with it. So every time I can and I try to replicate the recipe from my grandma. I'm not doing it just to connect with my grandma, but I'm doing it to connect with my family, with my country, with my culture, while at the same time in eating something that is really delicious, very healthy, and, and very nutritious in, in many ways, you know? So it, it communicates those types of meanings, you know? And it always happens to us that sometimes when you are eating something and it reminds you of a recipe from a grandfather or a grandmother or something like that, you know? Or when you're traveling and you feel like, man, I kind of miss something from home, you know? like there are different things like that. So food is also communicating a lot of different aspects that sometimes we forget about, you know, and all of those things are part of, of uh, what food waste are. So having said all of that, we have to understand that food waste is a very dynamic process. So it's not just one definition, it's just a dynamic process that it's culturally constructed and, and marks social boundaries, it uh, communicates meaning, you know, and, and there's many other aspects of, of food waste that can be changing. And also in, in we can see now in current times more clearly, especially in a multicultural place like here in, in Minneapolis, that how food waste are adapting as well. We are changing our diets. We are incorporating new products into our uh, ways of eating and everything. And that doesn't mean that we are changing who we are or anything. It's just, we are adapting to new times, uh, responding to different other problems that we're having now with our environment, with climate change and, and issues related to sustainability and everything, we are adapting in different ways. And indigenous groups in Native American tribes, they are also adapting their own diets to newer uh, circumstances and everything. And that is part of what food waste is. So it is a dynamic process. So anyway, if you don't mind moving to the next one, please. So. Trying to explain all of that a little bit, I wanted to put this slide here because this is kind of how we see it food waste in, in my work at Natives. So not only are the cultural, social, and economic practices, as I said before, but also food waste are this intersection of food in culture, traditions, and history. Because everything that we talk about food is what's happening now, that it's been heavily influenced what happened in the past as well. And it's also heavily influenced by our traditions and our culture in general, you know, including our language and our beliefs and everything. So uh, a way that I'd like to define food waste is this that is highlighted in blue, is the structure beliefs and behaviors surrounding the production, distribution, and consumption of food. So I try to have like a very holistic approach of what food waste are. So it's not just the way we eat or the things we eat, but also how we uh, acquire those products, how we decide to grow them or we forge them or whatever, how we distribute it about among our community as well. But also it's uh, food waste is related to the behaviors all and the beliefs that we have related to food. There are certain foods that have very special spiritual properties that helps us connect with certain aspects of our land and the behaviors that uh, Native Americans, for instance, or many other indigenous groups around the world have uh, this strong connection with Mother Earth, accepting that Mother Earth is providing some, uh, some things to you that you can eat. And so you have to replicate, uh, rep uh, you have to give something back, you know, and, and there is a whole process. There are rituals in some cases in which you have to, har if you want to harvest something, you have to follow some type of uh, ritual and stuff like that. And those are all of those things, all of those beliefs, all of those behaviors and traditions and, and everything. It's what food waste really are. So anyway, I hope that wasn't too confusing, but that's what I'm trying to get is that food waste is a very holistic, it's a very uh, broad uh, approach to food and in, in that it's also dynamic, that it's also constantly changing and adapting to new circumstances, new environments and all of that. So can we move to the next? 
So now to give you a little bit of an idea of like focusing a little more in North America, speaking like the US and well, North America in general, from Mexico, the US and Canada. And this is a, a list of some of the ingredients that are uh, indigenous to this, this part of the world. And you can see that there's a lot of them that you might feel like very, very familiar with. And you know that for instance, some of them that I cannot live without like chocolate or something like that, you know, but you can see that there is this is just a nice variety also of things. That's why I put this list. I picked like randomly different things to show like there is a, a really good variety of different things that you can eat. So if you're focusing just in one area or something, that doesn't mean that your diet is gonna be very restricted to certain things. Usually the environment, wherever you are, it produces a lot of different things that in some cases, sometimes maybe we don't consider them necessarily as food or something. And that's gonna be depending on your culture. And more specifically, like if, if we talk about Minnesota, like things like wild rice, for instance, is something so important, so culturally important, uh, environmentally important, because it's part of this ecosystem in the, in the state and all of that with all the lakes and all of it. Uh, but again, it's like uh, it, uh, wild rice, the whole tradition, the whole history of wild rice, it helps identify a lot of the Native American tribes that we have in the state. They identify themselves, they have histories or stories about the creation that are related to wild rice. The, the way that they were moving around the world until they get to a place where the food grows on water. And that is one of the very important uh, stories that they have as Anishinaabe people, and that is related to wild rice. So that is something that represents so much a uh, big part of their own culture. But then we have some other things like sunchokes on Timsula that, that grow around here, grow in, even in the cities and in other surroundings on the state that are not very common, but they're like really important and really delicious. And they could be like really important, uh, you know, uh, something that you can use instead of some of the most common things that we've been using so far. You know, like a sunchoke, you can treat it as a potato basically. Timsula, you can use it as a turnip or different things like that. So they, it adds more variety to your, to your diet. So if we move to the next one, please. And these are like more uh, plant-based products and stuff, but then we are thinking about like more the, the animal proteins and stuff. Of course, we have to think, speaking of North America, of the American bison, turkey, and there are other ones, for, of course. You know, there's like, for instance, uh, duck, we have rabbits, we have venison, uh, have beavers, and we have different other types of animals that you can, that can provide you all the protein that is necessary for a very balanced diet. And that is something that, as we know, historically, for instance, bison has like a very, very difficult history because bison was something so representative of many Native American cultures, you know, and because of that, there was like a very problematic relationship with the Western world, with colonization and all of that with bison, because it was something so representative of a lot of the Native American tribes. And, and it's something that it's still prevalent. We still use it in, in the indigenous food lab. We use a lot of bison, a lot of turkey and all of that because we are working with local producers that are still producing this kind of uh, protein and making it available to the general public in general. You know, So can we go to the next one, please? So thinking a little bit, give you a little bit of a list of ingredients from North America, uh, uh, mention some of the animal protein and stuff. So if you think of eating, indigenous food, if you focus on an indigenous diet more specifically. So these are some of the benefits that you would get. You would get healthy fats, you will get healthy and very diverse proteins. You will have a diet that is low on carb, low on salt. Uh, you will be talking about a very uh, a big amount of different of diversity of plants, regardless of where your environment is, even in some areas that are seem like kind of uh, kind of arid with not much vegetation and stuff. Usually there are a lot of things that you can still eat and you can find. Uh, when we're thinking about like this indigenous food waste in general, so that we are talking about the traditional ways of producing and, and obtaining and harvesting, foraging or growing and tending the different plants and stuff. So we are talking about an organic agriculture and an organic process of producing all of these and, and that it's connected spiritually, culturally and environmentally uh, appropriate uh, relationship with the land as well. 
Also on indigenous diet, celebrate cultural and regional diversity because you will focus a lot more on what you have around. So you just need to start looking around. So that's one of the important things of an indigenous diet in general is that it encourages you to regain, to relearn how to connect with mother earth in general, how to connect with your environment, how to walk outside and see the plants and try to learn about the plants that are outside in your yard or in your neighborhood. And, and try to see if some of those are actually food. There might be a lot of the plants here in the cities. We have a lot of different plants that are growing everywhere in different parts of the city that are edible, that we could be using them in a, in a better way, that it will be more sustainable, it will be more environmentally friendly and all of that. And also thinking of an indigenous diet, we will uh, focus more on a regional and a seasonal based uh, food system, which globally is something that we are starting to have that conversation because of issues related to climate change and sustainability and, and, and all of that and movements of food sovereignty and, and talking about food security and all of that. This is some approach that some people are starting to, to try to focus a little more that we should eat more regionally and seasonally based because that is the way we used to do it in the past as well. And it's a way that it's more sustainable and it will be better. So. Basically, when you think about indigenous diet, it, one of the interesting things is that you have to think that an indigenous diet, it's what almost what every other diet that you know, it's striving to be, you know? It's a diet that it's really healthy. It's really, like I said, low in carbs, low in salt, high in proteins and all of that, but it's also gluten-free, it's dairy-free. It's all of those things that other diets are trying to, to find a way. And just by acknowledging your local area, your environment and the cultures that live around you and try to engage with that and engage with your environment, you could have a really, really uh, good diet that it will be beneficial, not only to you or your family, but everybody, including the environment where you live in. Okay, now we could move to the next one. Now I wanted to mention briefly a little bit of the type of work we've been doing at, at Natives. So our main mission is to promote indigenous food waste education and also try to facilitate indigenous food access. That's the main goal. So it's a very broad uh, mission that we have, which allows us to, to tackle uh, food systems, food waste in a very holistic approach as well, trying to collaborate always with uh, Native American tribes, but everybody else who is interested on in food. So can we move please? So as part of Natives, one of the main programs that we have is the Indigenous Food Lab, <clears throat> which is a running kitchen that it's located in the Midtown Global Market uh, here in Minneapolis. And it's a functioning kitchen that it's been operating for over a year now uh, in different ways. Like our intention for this, or, uh, this Indigenous Food Lab is uh, that it's, it is a culinary training center. It's not just a kitchen that it's producing foods uh, and we, we don't sell the food or anything like that. So it is a culinary training center in which we can uh, encourage and, and support people who are interested in learning about indigenous foods and how to uh, engage with them and how to cook them and everything. Uh, that this is the place that we're trying to do that. But because of the pandemic, we had to switch gears a little bit and we were doing different type of work also with Indigenous Food Lab while we were continuing trying to do a little bit of the training and, and stuff like that. So can we move to the next, please? So to give you an idea, based on the pandemic, because of the pandemic, we had to switch gears. And first, we started with a program last year between August and November in which we produced almost 13,000 bowls of uh, food that you can see one of the bowls there in the, in the picture that are all indigenous ingredients, all indigenous recipes created by the chefs that work with us there in the indigenous food lab. And we started uh, this program distributing food to different homeless encampments in the city and also distributing to other organizations and, and groups of people that they were in need. So that was one of the programs that we did. Then we continued, if we move to the next please, during November and February uh, last winter, we engaged with nine of the 11 uh, tribes in the state, Native American tribes in the state. And we had a, a, an agreement and a program in which we were producing at a rate of 10,000 meals a week and being distributed to all these uh, nine tribes around the state, especially to the elder communities and elder facilities and stuff that they have and other groups of people that they were struggling with food. So we were using the, our indigenous food lab to produce all indigenous food, indigenous ingredients, uh, create indigenous recipes, 
and and help support people that it was that was in need and as part of that we said like well we can do this we can feed this the, the food to everyone which is something great but we thought like we should do a little extra we should do a little more that follows a little bit our mission as well and that is why we started creating that uh, picture that you see on the bottom left a one sheet insert that we were submitting every week that we were sending to every family that who was receiving all these meals uh, they were receiving a little uh, one sheet insert in which we share some information about different topics, uh, focusing some of on the indigenous ingredients that we were uh, using during this program. We shared some other extra little recipes sometimes, and we even in, uh, give some information in our main paragraph in the middle. We share different things, like uh, for instance, introducing these ideas of what what. It, what it means to talk about indigenous food systems, what it means to talk about food sovereignty, that it's something that a lot of the tribes are engaging in different programs and stuff, but there's still some confusion sometimes about what it really means. So we were trying to share some information about that as well and, and, and provide more information about the food that they were eating. And as part of that, while we were cooking all of these, we were developing about 17, 18 soup recipes that we've used, that we developed and used for this program. So we thought that that should be another extra thing that we should do. And we created this uh, little recipe booklet that includes all the 17 soup recipes created by our chefs at, at the Indigenous Food Lab. And we had the little booklet and it's a small little recipe book that incorporates all the recipes, as I said, and also has a basic information. I don't know if you can see in my picture here, but has a little information, introductory information about all the tribes that we were working with as well. Uh, and this was a collaborative effort in which all the chefs participated on creating this, this recipe book, including the design and, and all of that. And now we are in the process of distributing this booklet to all the families that received the soups last year with the hope that uh, if they had some favorites or if they like the soups and stuff, they can actually recreate them now. They, have, uh, they will have the recipes available to, for them. Um, now, could we move to the next? And the other aspects of the education side of, of natives that we're doing is we're developing education material for all ages. We are creating some type of booklets and now we move up, away a little bit from these booklets from the pictures, but we are developing these toolkits for teachers for elementary, middle and high school in which we are focusing about a specific topics. Like for instance, the one you see on the left focuses only on squash that we call it all about squash. We talk about different varieties of squashes, the names and activities for children to work and share some stories about the traditional ways of uh, harvesting and drying them and dehydrating them and, and, and preserving them and all of that. Working on wild rice and another one on berries, different wild berries and corn and beans. And we're gonna keep moving that way, but that's one, one of the things we're doing. Uh, we move to the next. We are also engaging in educational formats that are not uh, formal education. So we're not focusing only to work with schools. Uh, we are also creating and, and developing presentations to participate in panels such as this one, for instance, and other types of discussions that we created a panel about food sovereignty a little bit ago in collaboration with uh, Dream of Wild Health, another nonprofit in local nonprofit. We are developing workshops that we are using internally for our own staff to continue training on understanding all this process of our vision. We give, uh, give guest lectures in different universities and schools and all of that. And we are also engaging on research in which we are developing, we are creating an indigenous ingredients database, which we have like, a, it's, a, it's a long process, it's a slow process because it's, we're trying to do like a proper, uh, a proper database that includes a lot of information, relevant information, including the cultural aspects, environmental aspects, political aspects, and everything about the ingredients we're using at the food lab. We are initiating a small research on food preservation techniques, traditional and, and modern ones, and see, discuss all about that. And that's pretty much it, the, the type of work we're doing. So if we move to the next one, this is the last one. I just wanted to share a little bit to give you an idea uh, of how you can start engaging or uh, in interacting a little more with indigenous foods. And it's something like, for instance, here in Minneapolis, I feel like it's really difficult to walk outside anywhere in the city and walk more than two blocks or something without finding a cedar tree. So that's why I wanted to share something about cedar, that it's a sacred tree, it's something really important, really relevant <clears throat> that grows in this area naturally. So 
It's something that you can use. You can walk. I encourage you to walk outside, find a little cedar tree, grab a little bit, a piece of, a, uh, of the leaves or a little branch for it. And uh, then also you can find some maple sugar uh, or maple syrup that it's something very, very North American that it's a really great healthier alternative to uh, sugar. And you can use those and you can combine them by following that very simple instruction, like simmering two cups of fresh cedar in four cups of boiling water for about 10 minutes. And then you can uh, strain it and sweeten up with some maple syrup. And you have like a really delicious tea that you can have it warm or you can have it cold if you want it. And it's a really healthy tea. It's very delicious, but it's also a medicine. It's also, that's another aspect of food. When we talk about food, it's not just what we eat, but it's the thing that relates to it. And a lot of it, it's the medicine that, uh, that comes with it as well. So uh, this cedar tea traditionally used for headaches, coughs, flu, fever. So this is a good time of the year to start having some cedar tea. And I just want to share that with you. And thank you again for the invitation. And with that, I'm done. I think you're- Sorry here. about that. Thank you, Mandu. That was really uh, fascinating. And I, I have had the opportunity to taste cedar tea and it is very tasty. Uh, and on that note, um, I wanted to talk, I wanted to change the perspective now to uh, Dr. Ed Fleming, who, as I mentioned, is the uh, curator and director of the anthropology department at our museum. And as we were planning about this and talking about uh, how the Indigenous Food Lab and Mandu's work is sort of documenting and projecting forward into the, the modern day and future of uh, Indigenous food. Uh, Dr. Fleming has some really interesting findings to share from some recent digs uh, about uh, food in this area uh, much longer ago. So I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Ed Fleming now to tell us a little bit more about his research. Thank you, Aaliyah, and thank you, Mandu. That was a, a wonderful presentation, and I love your broad um, description of, of foodways. Um, as Aaliyah said, I'm, I'm Ed Fleming. I'm the Curator of Anthropology at the Science Museum, and as a curator here, I have the wonderful privilege of being a steward of our cultural collections, um, which are far-ranging and diverse. They're global in, um, in scope and span uh, over 100,000 years of time. Um, and within, you know, that, that large span, um, we have quite a lot of food related material culture, um, objects related to cooking and, and preparing food and such. And I, I just wanted to point out, um, before I get started on the archaeology, um, this collection of heritage seeds that we have that's been um, subject of a, a program for a number of years. Um, this is a collection of um, seeds that uh, was begun uh, by an, uh, an amateur anthropologist back in the 30s and 40s. And he traveled around the, the, the US, mostly the Plains and, and the Midwest, interacting with seed savers among um, numerous native tribes and, and collected various um, cultivated seeds from those folks. He also interacted with, with other um, you know, larger seed saver organizations and put together a really great collection of um, cultivated uh, vegetables that um, uh, that kind of represent a, a broad diversity in um, corn, beans, squash, um, sunflower, and, and things like that across the um, across the U.S. and donated it to the museum back in the '70s. And we have we had a program where we were growing out. Um, it's on pause at the moment, but we hope to bring it back. But we were growing out. Um, these seeds in our big backyard um, and then uh, reaccessioning them back into the collection with the hopes of eventually um, growing out our seed stock enough that we'll be, um, we hope to rematriate, um, give back some of these seed varieties back to some of the, the communities from which they came. So that's, that's an exciting project. Now, um, you know, food is, as, as an anthropologist, as an archeologist, I'm fascinated by food. Um, it's it's cultural. It's broadly cultural. Um, it's also personal. Some of the stories that Mandu told about, you know, soups and things that you know uh, remind him of home. It's 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 deeply personal, um, and it's also dynamic. It changes. It's not a stagnant sort of thing. It um, it's a cooking is a creative process, and so it it really creates a, an interesting window into um, culture and and tradition when we all travel, you know, I think it's pretty typical to really want to experience the 
the food of different regions to, to better understand um, people. So let's travel into the past. Um, go back, Aliyah, please. So I'm going to talk about two archaeological projects. I'm, a, I'm an archaeologist and I um, am interested in um, uh, pre-contact times uh, in, in um, the upper Midwest. And I'm going to highlight two projects, one that's current, that's, that's happening. I don't really have many results, but it's an exciting project um, that has a, uh, a food waste component to it. And, that's, and then the other one is one that, that we kind of recently finished up, and I, I'll have some actual um, data to share. Uh, so the first project I want to talk about is the, the Peterson site project, which is um, the Peterson site is located on this island you see in, um, in this lake in southwestern Minnesota. And it's a fascinating, it's, it's one of um, the probably the most important sites in, in Minnesota because it contains on that island, there is 10,000 years of, of history represented um, in the archaeology there. So as, as soon as the glaciers moved out, people moved in and they were using this island, which at times was a peninsula um, during low water times. And so we have 10,000 years of archaeological evidence on this island, which documents change um, in cultural traditions and changes in environmental conditions. Um, and we're working on, on better documenting some of the processes of these changes and, and perhaps some of the, the reasons for change. Um, so Aliyah, you can go to the next slide. One of the, one, one very visible um, piece of evidence for cooking, of course, uh, post 2,500 years ago, or of the last 2,500 years is ceramic cooking pots. And uh, ceramics are, are fascinating for us to study because they're like cooking. It's, uh, ceramics is an art form and it changes according to, you know, who is making them, the artist and their inspirations. And so we can use ceramics to, um, to date sites and to understand interaction among different, different communities. Um, but it's from a cooking perspective and a food perspective, it's what was in the pots that, that is interesting. And, and there are ways of, um, if there is residue uh, preserved on the ceramic sherds, we can examine them chemically. And that's something with this site, we, um, we have done a, a little bit of that work with, on a couple pots from this site. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so the Science Museum excavated the Peterson site back in the, the early and mid 1970s. One of the, the large features, and we call things that are in the ground um, that provide evidence about human behavior that are kind of tangible, we can put a boundary around them, we call them features, and they can be fire hearths or um, evidence of, of structure basins or um, storage pits and things like that. So one, one of the large features that they excavated in uh, 1974 was this, this large pile, it looks like a pile of rocks, um, it, but it's, it's, a, it's a pile of um, fire modified rocks that was in sort of a basin. Um, what, it, what it was was a, a giant earthen oven used for um, for, for cooking things. Um, and you could see it's about, you know, three meters across. In 1974, they excavated the whole thing. Um, and we have all the artifacts that were associated with it. And, and it appears to date to the late pre-contact time, the, the last thousand years, probably about a thousand to um, about 1400 CE. Um, and that's about all we can say about it because it was fully excavated. And this was back in the seventies and, and they didn't have the benefits of some of the archeological uh, techniques that we have today. So go to the next slide. We reinitiated some research at this site a, uh, a couple of years ago. And then this last summer, we finally um, actually did some, some field work on site. Prior to doing field work, it's become pretty standard methodology to work with a, a group of geophysicists. And, and I work with um, Dave Mackey of Archaeophysics most of the time, a local group of geophysicists. Um, and they apply instruments to that um, allow us to, in a sense, see beneath the, the surface. Uh, magnetometry and electrical resistivity are the, the main techniques. Sometimes ground penetrating radar is employed as well. And so on this site, um, they went over the northern part of the island with, uh, with magnetometer and electrical resistivity, trying to, um, to, to detect changes in the soil beneath the surface that may be cultural. So we could see a, a sort of a distribution of cultural features across that part of the site to um, potentially, um, well, to target uh, where we put our excavation units in the hope, in this case, of uh, locating another one of these 
large um, earthen ovens so we can can learn more about um, about this this method of cooking. And so in um, so go back just real quickly. Uh, in the geophysical data, you see in that center image just kind of a, a shadowy um, blob. Uh, and we suspect it in, in the, the data told us that that was a, an area of high resistance and, and high um, magnetic. So um, the, the possibility was there that this was another um, large rock feature. So now you can go to the next one. We excavated a um, just a two, just to test it. We didn't want to excavate the whole thing until we knew more of what we were getting into. So we excavated a two by two meter block and sure enough, boom, there's a, another earth, earthen oven right there that we were able to test. And the dimensions appear from the geophysics and the excavation work that it is nearly identical in, in size to the one um, and shape to the one that uh, Joe Hudak excavated in 1974. And that opened a great opportunity for us to really try and learn more about um, this cooking technique. And the way um, earthen ovens uh, tend to be used is they rocks are heated up elsewhere usually and then move to a location where the cooking is going to happen and put into uh, a basin of sorts and these these hot these rocks are heated up to um, when they're glowing red they are as hot as 900 degrees so you can imagine when you have a three by three meter pile of these glowing hot rocks um, what kind of heat would be thrown off of it and there's a couple of different ways uh uh, globally that these um, sorts of features are used um, in cooking. One is to um, hang, you know, racks or scaffolds over the top of it and, and hang, um, you know, food, meat, and, and vegetables and such off of that. Um, another way is to actually um, wrap the meat or the, the food in uh, like a tamale um, in corn husk or, or leaves and then uh, Put it directly on the rock and then bury the the earthen oven again and then re-excavate it um, after a, a certain amount of time and then you have roasted meat. Um, so go to the next slide, Leo. So we uh, are in the process of applying a, a, a whole series of different um, techniques to better understand um, how things were cooked on, on this earthen oven and what was cooked on the earth oven. And we're partnering with um, some colleagues at the University of Minnesota's Institute for Rock Magnetism. And they have collected this fire cracked rock, these fire altered rocks, certain samples of them. They'll be applying various magnetic techniques um, to understand uh, the intensity that they were heated up at, the, perhaps the, um, the, the temperature that they were heated at and um, how often these, these rocks were moved around. Was this earth oven reused over time or was it a, a single event? The artifacts associated with the earthen oven um, indicate, and these are all being washed in the lab right now, and these are just my field identifications, but uh, we still need to analyze it. But um, it does point to um, a feature that is similar in age to the one that Joe Hudak excavated in 1974. So dating to the late pre-contact, probably about 1200 in this case, that little sherd that I'm holding in the upper left is uh, um, of a style that, that points to about um, 1200 CE. And then um, we'll be uh, um, identifying the animal and plant remains from, from the feature on the left. Those are bags of soil. These are uh, bags of data gold for us. They're, they're full of the soil, but also all of the, um, you know, the wood charcoal and uh, any plant remains that, that are preserved as well as small animal bone. And then um, in the lower right, that's a, um, a fragment of a bison, um, a bison mandible that was found near, near this particular feature. And, and this is a, an island out in the middle of the prairie, you know, um, and in this case, you know, this feature dating to about 1200, there were bison everywhere. And the main animal that we have noticed, and this is, again, field identified, um, but bison's pretty obvious in the field, and there's a lot of bison there. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the, the second project I want to talk about is the Sheffield site project. So we're moving from southwestern Minnesota, the prairies, um, up to the, to the woodlands of the St. Croix Valley. I've had a research program in the St. Croix Valley for a number of years documenting um, sites and settlements along the lower valley. And one of the, the sites that was a, a major focus of our research um, recently is the Sheffields.
Hey everyone, I am so sorry. I think we just lost Ed. Um, I'm gonna see if I can't get him back on the call. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> let's see. Hang on folks, so sorry about this. Mandu, I hate to put you on the spot, but while uh, while we're waiting, can you talk a little bit about some of the the recipes that you guys used in your in your food bowls uh, with natives earlier? Some of the recipes that have gotten especially good responses. I think people might be interested in that. Sure, I can I can try to share something. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry to put you on the spot. No, it's fine. Uh, it's what we're dealing with with these times, you know, of a virtual world, I think. There's a lot of these issues happening. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, we like I said, we've been, for that particular program last year, we've been developing uh, a lot of different recipes. <clears throat> and we switched a little bit over the winter to start developing more soups because it was we were producing so many meals that soup was a little bit easier to make, easier to pack, easier to transport and all of that. So yeah, we created a, a variety of them. Uh, and I, I can, I don't know, kind of read, read you some of the ingredients or something to some of them to give you an idea of the type of things we were working on. One of them, we call it the lake trout and leek soup, for instance that uh, it has uh, obviously lake trout, but it has uh, leeks obviously, but then we mix it with turnips and also carrots, garlic. We use uh, sage. We use a little bit of the same fish stock uh, and also apple cider vinegar and, and that's it. You know, that's basically the, the, the recipe. So as you can tell, it's a very simple one, but at the same time, it's like very, very tasty, very nutritional and, and very good. And, and again, uh, culturally appropriate, if you want. Another one that it was very interesting, it's uh, something that we were making. Uh, they were the bison meatballs. We've been making bison meatballs and a lot of people was getting very interested on that. And we had a lot of uh, interesting feedback for those because people like them. And we, you know, it's basically making a, a, a simple meatball that, but we incorporate a lot of different veggies into it. Uh, we mix it with cranberries as well, a little bit of uh, uh, <clears throat> sage as well. So you're trying to use different spices, a little bit of uh, staggered sumac as well to add to it, to add a very particular flavor to it. And then we mix that into a soup as well that, uh, that it was very, very, very tasty. But I can see that Ed's back, so I'm yeah. just gonna pass that it sounds, That sounds delightful. Uh, I, yeah, I love the idea of bison meatballs and so many other things. So I think we should absolutely talk a little bit more about things that people should be trying uh, as soon as we wrap this presentation with Ed. We're so glad you're back, Ed. We missed you. I am going to go back to your slideshow here in just a moment. Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry. I had a power outage for... at my house, but I, I seem to be back up and rolling here. So All right. So I think you were talking about the Sheffield uh, site. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit. You can go to the next slide. I, I'm not sure exactly where I cut out, but we have, um, you know, we've excavated a number of cooking related features at the site, rock line pits, storage pits, um, roasting pits and things like that. And that's what you're seeing right here. We also have um, collected agricultural tools and that that's what I think I was talking about when I cut out um, on the previous slide, there's a, um, a picture of a series of um, deer scapulas that were have the wear pattern similar to bison scapula hose that are used in southern Minnesota, but up in the woodlands, um, bison is not all that common or was not as accessible and so deer scapulas were used instead and that um, use of deer uh, also can be seen in the, the animal bones as well. So you can go to the next, the next slide. Um, in, uh, I worked with a, a colleague of mine, uh, zooarchaeologist Aaron Armstrong, um, who teaches at Normandale, uh, and he identified all the animal bone for us. And what we saw at uh, the Sheffield site is really a, a nice reflection of the, um, you know, the forest and riverine environment. Um, kind of the big, um, the, the, the big one, like I said, is, is deer. That was definitely by far the most prevalent, um, but also 
uh, beaver and um, Canada goose are, are well represented too. And, um, you know, when we see animal bone in the archaeological record, uh, you know, we presume they may have been consuming these animals, but also, um, you know, these animals were used for a wide variety of things like, you know, bison had all sorts of uses beyond, um, beyond food. You see the, the beaver there, you know, pelts were, um, were also obtained uh, in this way. You can go to the next slide. And then this just shows, the next slide shows um, kind of the whole roster of, of the, the various animals that were represented in the archaeological record at um, at the Sheffield site from large animals to small animals and, and fish and, and waterfowl and such. Um, and then this is just a, a, a listing of, of what's represented. Um, and I want to quickly go into the next piece. So my uh, one of my assistants, Jasmine Conker, was going to be presenting to you on the plant remains, and she had a, a family emergency, so was not able to join us today. So I'm going to cover her part. And Jasmine um, is a paleoethnobotanist. Her um, her specialty is identifying plant remains in the archaeological record, and that's something that's really um, kind of a new discipline in archaeology of the last, I mean, by new, probably the last 30 years or so. It's become commonplace. When we excavate a feature, first we identify it. In the upper left picture, you can see that that sort of white smudge at the the north or the south rather of the unit, the top of the unit. Um, you know, that's the top of a, of one of these Ashfield roasting pits, and we identify that. Um, we don't excavate it in the same way. We actually collect all of the soil um, and put it into these soil bags so that we could bring it back to our float lab, which we have set up at the Synchro Watershed Research Station. And Jasmine. Um, she likes to say she gives the soil a bath. She puts it into agitated water, that, um, that uh, device that she's working on. That's her in the middle. You can see kind of the top of her head. Um, but um, she's giving the soil a bath, put it into agitated water, and that separates the sediment from the, um, the plant remains, which essentially floats up to the top, and she can skim it off. And these plant remains um, not only provide a record of the, the food that was being um, consumed or grown, um, but also uh, it, it, um, uh, we get wood charcoal from, uh, you know, from firewood. So it also provides a record of um, firewood choices. Um, different woods were used for different things. Mandu mentioned, you know, cedar is a very important wood and that shows up in, in specific contexts um, and is also a reflection of the local environment. And so by looking at the plant remains, we can not only um, work towards reconstructing past diets, but um, also reconstructing past environments. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful technique. You can go to the next slide. Now at the Sheffield site, the cultivated plants at the Sheffield site um, include uh, um, maize, squash, sunflower, um, bottle gourd, um, and a little bit of bean. It's some of the earlier bean actually that's, that shows up in the upper Midwest. Bean was a, a later um, domesticate. And then um, on the next slide, shows the non-cultigen, so not, not everything food related or consumed um, uh, was actually grown. Um, and, and so can you go to the next slide, Liam? I'm trying, <laughs> it's acting up. Okay, so the next, the next slide just shows um, more like gathered or foraged plants and that, that includes, um, well, I'm so sorry. I don't know why this one slide doesn't want to play. I can read. Should I read off what the I'm looking at it and it looks sure. fantastic. Yeah, why don't you re read yeah, them off? Sure. And often before you before you do that, um, you know, these are these are plants that that we sometimes, you know, Mondo touched on this a little bit that we might just consider all oh, those are weeds or whatever, but they are consumable and they they were um, used in the past and are and are part of um, you know indigenous food ways anyway in, in this area. Go ahead, Aliyah, read, read those off for me. Yeah, I was I was just going to say when we were planning this yesterday, it was just uh, a really interesting conversation because there are so many things that I don't even think about as foods. Uh, but marsh elder, acorn nuts, hickory nuts, ragweed, sumac, mushroom, uh, goosefoot, pigweed, honey locust pods, grapes, and of course wild rice. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I'll just end by saying, you know, archaeology is, is just one uh, method, I suppose. Oh, there we go. One method of, um, you know, attempting to learn about past food ways and, um, you know, uh, collaboration with um, 
indigenous chefs is another way that we could potentially, you know, kind of build that out. And um, Mandu and I had talked about how uh, archaeological reports and these data can actually potentially be um, useful for the database that that he is is building. Um, archaeologically, what we have is a series of in, what we're, we're producing through these projects is, um, you know, a, uh, listings of ingredients. These are ingredient lists, but we don't necessarily know how they go together. And if these features are used over and over, you know, we're seeing multiple ingredients kind of accumulated over time, but we are producing these ingredients lists. And by partnering with um, with folks like, like Mandu and others, we can potentially um, uh, these ingredient lists can be uh, potentially used to not only, um, you know, re reconstruct or reclaim past diets and culinary techniques, but can also push things forward because, you know, food works both ways and it's constantly evolving. So I'll, I will end with that. And um, I think if we have time, I hope we have time to take a couple of questions. Yeah, I think we do. Uh, if I can get my silly screen to stop sharing now. Um, come on, stop sharing. I was just moaning about technology issues this morning to Ed, and who knew he was going to have a power search? Well, Ed and Mandu, I want to thank you both for joining us today. Uh, we, we're going to start, I am going to remind everyone, we have time for maybe one question from uh, the audience, but to start at us off, we talked a little bit in our planning about uh, this idea of new and old evidence of what makes Indigenous food. So, uh, Mandu, I wonder if I could start with you and get you to turn your video back on. Uh, could you comment a little bit on how some of this uh, evidence that Ed's uncovered informs your work at uh, Natives? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is really interesting to, to have this conversation with Ed the other day too, because it, it, it helps us, like with the information that they are getting, it will help us inform in in a way if you want kind of recover part of the the, the history of the traditional ways of <clears throat> preparing some meals or some foods and stuff like that but also it's interesting to see how we can understand this like we were talking about food waste they're dynamic how things how recipes how ingredients how the use of some things have been changing through time and how the way are used more traditionally now and, and same thing with the cooking techniques, you know, like cooking techniques are a bit different now, uh, but in some areas, in some parts of the state or some tribes or something, they are maintaining some of their traditional ways of doing it sometimes. And that is something that we are really interested about as well and trying to collaborate with Ed possibly to see if we can get some of those, uh, some of that data that he has, some of the list of ingredients, the, the information about the, the heat on the stones for the ovens and stuff like that. And maybe with the food lab, we could try to replicate those techniques, those ways and see how those foods uh, were actually made and, and how they taste even, you know, and then we could do a whole process of analyzing like the nutritional components or value and all of that if you wanted to as well. But that is like a wonderful way to, to, to connect if you want the past with the present, you know, and it, it will totally inform what, we, what is happening right now and understanding the whole holistic approach of uh, food systems or food waste in general, you know. So I think it's I'm excited to try to collaborate with, with Ed, you know, and also like he was saying, adding some of the information they have into the database that we have, because we want to make sure that as soon as we, we find a good way to do it, we want to make this database available to the general public. So the more data, the more information is available, the more complete, the better it's going to be. And also our, our way of working is through collaboration. You know, we wanna collaborate with groups and we wanna collaborate with Ed now <laughs> and use some of that information and see if at the museum also, you can use some of this information that we're getting on the database or all the, the recipe development that we're having and all of that, it's, it's, I think it just blends perfectly, you know? Ed, anything you would add? Uh, I guess all I would add to that is that um, I'm an eager, collaborator. So um, yeah, I look forward to moving this conversation forward and see where it can go. And, and, you know, it can, it can circle back where um, some of your work can also inform, you know, the, the future archaeological work too, and some of the directions we, we take the research, you know, with, with the Peterson site, for example, that, you know, most of that feature is still there. So we might generate new questions that would 
um, make it worth going out there to uncover more of it to learn more about you know some of the activity areas in in the you know the neighboring areas and such. So I have a question from Janet, and I actually think this is a great one to wrap with, and I'm going to expand it a little bit. So Janet asks uh, if the recipe is book uh, that you mentioned, Mandu, is available online, and I guess I would have you comment on that, but then also let people know where else they can go to find Indigenous recipes if they want to try cooking with any of these ingredients at home. Sure. At the moment, this, this little booklet, this recipe booklet is not available online because, as I said, we were developing, working on all of this, and we managed to print uh, enough copies right now to distribute to all the people that were receiving the meals in the past, uh, in the past, past winter. Um, we do have some extra copies that I'm happy to share with the museum or, or some of you. Uh, and at the Indigenous Food Lab right now, we are also initiating some construction. We're gonna be developing a little more and we're gonna create a little market space in which we can collaborate with indigenous producers and local producers, farmers to start uh, providing a little more easier access to these indigenous foods. And as part of that, we are hoping to have some of these recipes, this booklet, and we are creating some other ones as well that are gonna be accompanying this one. So they're gonna be available there as well um, soon, but at the moment they're not. So it's because it's just, we just finished them and we focus right now our priorities to have enough to distribute to the people that they were in need. And, uh, and in order to, to but as I said, like if you contact me or through Aliyah or something, I'm happy to to make some of this available to you guys uh, for sure. And uh, the the other thing, to following the the question, uh, where to get more access? There are a lot of, uh, well, not not a lot, but there are some. If you look online, even you can find some books and things that are talking about it. But one of the important ones, obviously, is the one written by Sean Sherman, the sous chef. Uh, cookbook that has a, a really interesting approach to understanding indigenous foods and, and sharing some recipes. But I think the other important way of getting access or understanding and learning about these indigenous foods and learning about recipes is coming to visit us in the, in the global market. Just come to the food indigenous food lab, talk to any of the chefs that are working there. We're constantly working on different things and we're more than willing to share everything that we're doing and share some of the recipes. And if you have even, often we have people coming and asking us very specific things, you know, that they learned something about staggered sumac and they don't know what it is or how to use it. And then we can have a conversation, a proper way of, sharing stories together and, and help you how to use all of those things. And I think that will be a nice way to do it as well. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap. Thank you both so much again. And thanks to all of you, uh, our members, for your support and for joining us this morning. I did go ahead and just post the names of the Sioux Chefs Indigenous Kitchen and just not to put too fine a point on it, but that's the nonprofit arm. Natives is the nonprofit arm of the Sioux Chefs Indigenous Kitchen or of Owamni. Uh, and uh, then, yes, the Indigenous Food Lab over at Midtown Global Market, go check it out. Uh, at the Science Museum, Ed and uh, Jasmine are always finding ways to share our findings. So keep watching our website and coming to visit us. Next month, our event is on the third Thursday, which is November 16th. And we're sticking with the food theme and doing an event about sustainability and brewing. So we'll see you back here on Zoom at 10 a.m. on November 16th. Thanks again so much for your help and for your support. Uh, it's delightful to see you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.